Watch the Box by Jean Sherrard. As a college student short on cash, I rode the rails. More of a boy's own adventure hobo. It was also a cheap way to get home for Christmas vacation. I'd heard the stories from more experienced bums about the dangers of riding alone, but discounted them. Youth has all the disadvantages of immortality and none of its bennies. Squatting around a guttering fire in a hobo camp across from the Spokane Yards, one old tramp pulled down his threadbare turtleneck to show me the raised scar across his throat, a smooth pink zipper stretching from ear to ear. Got this when I fell asleep without a partner to watch my back. Never ever fall asleep on your own. I count myself lucky, though, he cackled. Fellow was too dumb to cut deep. Only got 56 cents off me. Guess my life is worth a few cents more than that. A second and almost equally important reason never to doze off alone is that there's no knowing if a train will stop and drop off boxcars somewhere. You might be snoozing away in one of those cars and when you wake up, find yourself miles from light and heat on a snowbound siding. Well, that's where my story begins. The westbound train I caught on track five that night had no open boxcars, so I climbed into a mail car that was just a flatbed with a postal service trailer loaded on it. With the sides open, it would be a cold trip, but I'd brought my heavy sleeping bag for just that eventuality. It would be at least another six hours before the next train. I climbed up onto the open car and crept under the mail truck, spreading out my foam pad and sleeping bag. Now, just as I climbed into my bag, the train lurched forward and after several bone-crunching stops and starts, began to roll out of the yard. When we had picked up enough speed to assure me that no one else could climb up and join me, I pulled the bag up around my head and tightened the drawstrings. A chill wind whistled past, the occasional snowflake nipping at my exposed cheeks. I buried myself in the warm down, and then, though I didn't mean to, I fell asleep. When I woke, I had no idea where I was. Everything was still, no sound, no motion, and then I remembered. I sat up in my mummy bag and banged my head on the struts of the trailer above me, setting off bright flares of pain behind my eyes. I went down hard, writhing on the bed of the mail car like a salted slug and fast forward. I probed gingerly, no blood, but an egg-sized lump was hatching above my right eye. I managed to loosen the drawstrings and poke my head out. In the dark, I could make out low rolling hills dusted with snow stretching out on either side. Glowering, oddly lit clouds threatened more snow. I was on a deserted siding somewhere between Spokane and Seattle, and there was no telling when these cars would be picked up again. It might be hours or days, but it made no difference. I wasn't about to wait and find out. It was shortly after midnight. I'd been following the tracks for several miles without any sign of a road or a town. I had an old tape of the Beatles on my Walkman. Love, love me do, they sang incongruously. Above the clouds had thinned, revealing a scrap of moon, but the surrounding plains exhaled a freezing mist that obscured my path. Grass grew between the tracks, and the rails were rough with rust. The trains must have stopped using them years before. As I walked, stepping from tie to tie, I reconsidered my love of riding the rails. It had been a fair-weather affectation. Now I longed for a soft bed and a warm fire. You know, I love you. The one patch of clear sky drifted beyond the moon, and now only a single star glittered, encroached by thickening clouds. I felt utterly alone. The world might have ended while I slept, leaving me the sole survivor. 
So please say you do. Without warning, a patch of fog brightened directly in front of me. For a moment, I thought the moon had reappeared, suddenly full and on the horizon, but that wasn't possible. The light grew brighter, shredding the mist. It was an oncoming train. Piercing the Beatles' keening guitars, I heard a shrill steam whistle. It was nearly on top of me, no more than 30 feet away. I threw myself off to one side of the tracks and tumbled down the embankment. The train, only six or seven cars long, blew past and disappeared. I got up and brushed myself off. It could have been worse. Landing on my sleeping bag had protected me from the sharp rocks at the bottom of the embankment. But where had that train come from? I'd nearly been turned to pulp by a steam engine barreling down an unused railroad at midnight in the middle of winter. All I could figure was it must have been one of those Christmas trains that operate during the holidays. Nothing else made sense. Another mile or so, this time without the Beatles for company, and I arrived at an improbable two-room tavern, perched between the tracks and a deserted country road. A red neon sign flickered Mel's Bar and Grill through the mist. Bright square windows were lit up, and the whine of country music wafted through the fog. Bells jingled as I stepped through the door into the steamy tavern. Hank Williams was on the jukebox, turned up loud. The place seemed empty, with only two battered tables and a small pink Formica counter that had once sat three. But one of the red leather seats was missing from its post. There must be somebody here, I thought, and shouted over the music through the swinging kitchen doors. Hello? Anybody home? In the surprised kitchen, a pan hit the floor. A moment later, an old man emerged, wide-eyed, wearing a stained apron. We're closed, he croaked, cleared his throat and tried again. <clears throat> closed. It didn't come out much better the second time, and he bent over in a fit of coughing. Not surprisingly, his yellow-gray face was a grid of smoker's wrinkles. Please, I said, I've been walking half the night. Just, just need to get warm. A cup of coffee would be great. He looked at me dubiously. I can pay, I insisted. Really? I just one cup, then you're on your way. He glanced at me, raising one bushy gray eyebrow. One cup? Before I could nod, he tottered back into the kitchen and returned with a chipped brown Denny's mug filled with coffee. Under the old man's observant gaze, I sat at the counter and took a sip, burning my mouth on the thick, stale coffee. Good, I stammered. Stinks, he said. Pot's two days old, but I keep it hot. Too hot to taste. Where are you from? Seattle. I was taking a train home from Spokane. What happened? Get off at the wrong stop? I fell asleep. Woke up on a siding. When he heard that, the old man's eyes sparked as merrily as if I'd lit a fuse. And a moment later, he exploded into laughter. Let me get this right. You woke up in the middle of nowhere and followed the rails here? Yeah, what's so funny? Well, since they built the new line 30 years ago, ain't nobody uses the old tracks. Don't even walk on them. Yet here you are. He chuckled again, shaking his head in amazement. Well, somebody's been using them. I nearly got run down by a Christmas train an hour ago. I took another sip of coffee and almost gagged. It had cooled to the point of undrinkability. The old man's face suddenly clouded over. What do you mean, Christmas train? I don't know. Some old steam engine came out of nowhere. Nearly cut me in half. He wasn't laughing now. He went back through the swinging doors and came out with a fresh pot of coffee. Looks like you need a refill, boy. I looked at him curiously. What had brought this on? Ain't no trains on these tracks. Fact is, there's a reason people stay away. Why I'm here is because I bought this place sight unseen 25 years ago. It seemed like a good idea at the time. He paused, recalling something that could never be changed, never digested, 
only chewed and chewed upon. But you stayed in business, I said. Ever hear of that basket with all the eggs? Well, this one's mine. He bit his lip ruefully, then took off his soiled apron. Want to hear a little story, son? The old man sat down next to me at the counter and poured himself a cup of coffee. I understood the bargain here. I listened to the story of his sad, lonely life, and in return, I got warm. Are you Mel? I asked, prompting him. Oh, the story's not about me, he smiled. No, th name's Harry. Bought the place from Mel Perkins. Afterwards, never bothered to change the name. Besides, even if I did, all my customers still call it Mel's. People change slow around these parts. Customers? I asked. One pot of coffee in two days didn't suggest volume traffic. Ah, during the day I still get a few wheat farmers, illegals, truckers taking the back roads to avoid tolls. But you're the first I've had after dark in years. Fact is, I'm officially closed. Well, your lights were on. The jukebox was playing. I like to leave my lights on when I'm by myself. Music, too. Makes me feel better. Almost like I got company. Harry grinned crookedly at me, adding yet another web of wrinkles to his leathery face. Story time, he said bemusedly. Used to tell my boys stories, but I made them all up. Well, this one's truer than true. He patted his shirt pocket and found nothing there. Damn. Do that by habit. Doc says I had to quit, so I quit, but I can't help feeling for what ain't there. The ghost pack. He chuckled at his joke, took another sip of coffee, and told me the following story, which I'll try to retell. It seems that back in the 30s, many rural areas of the state hadn't yet received electricity, much less phone service. The little country train stations that dotted rail lines all across the country doubled as telegraph and post offices for spread out communities of farmers and cattlemen. The telegraphers who manned these little one or two room stations were a special breed, inventive, intelligent, highly trained men accustomed to long days and lonely nights. Ready to ride out into a blizzard to repair a downed line or to flag down a through train when the pass was snowed under or a bridge was out. Gideon Craswell was such a man. A loner, not particularly liked by the wheat farmers who plowed the rich volcanic soil of the Columbia River Basin, but respected for the fine telegrapher that he was. Like all of his breed, he heard the dots and dashes of Morse more as a spoken language than as a code to be translated. When the key clocked out its messages, he knew which of the operators down the line were sending it. Each of them had their own style, or as Gideon thought of it, their own accent. Bill Sparky Wadsworth in Spokane, even at 25 words a minute, took the slightest pause after every fifth word, giving his transmissions an odd twang of anticipation, as if a step had been added on a familiar flight of stairs. Curly Parker and Twisp had the habit of running his T's, dash, and his W's, dot, dash, dash, together, so that new telegraphers often log messages from Yisp, Washington. And Dude's Bandolier in Moses Lake occasionally dropped the R's off the ends of words, resulting in what Gideon heard as a drawl from East Texas, which was, in fact, where Dude's had been born. But Gideon took the cake. He held the Washington State record for speed at 32 and a half words per minute. Harry Turner, the fastest tele... Harry Turner, the fastest telegrapher on the planet, never beat 35. Well, why Gideon wasn't working out of Boise or Spokane or Seattle where the pay was better and the hardships fewer, no one knew for sure. The truth was that he liked his privacy. He preferred being alone for long stretches with only the wind and the telegraph for company. If given the choice, he would work the night shift when there were times he felt like the last man alive. 
Perhaps key to understanding Gideon was that that was a feeling he particularly enjoyed. The evening Gideon relieved Willie Braxton was a little different from any other, except that Willie was especially eager to get home that night, and not just because it was Christmas Eve. As Gideon drove up in his shay, Willie was waiting for him on the steps in the dusk, bundled in fur. The air had smelled of snow all day, and now the first few flakes flew around him like sparks from an unseen fire. "'What are you doing, Willie?' Gideon called. Uh, "'Just taking the air, Gideon,' Willie called back, stomping his feet on the landing and flapping his arms. He looked like a giant furred hen. "'After a day in this little cracker box, man feels a mite tight.' When Gideon opened the stable door, he was surprised to see Willie's nag already saddled. Willie, following close behind, took his mare by the bridle and led her out into the snow. "'You in some kind of hurry?' Uh, Martha's got me a turkey cooking, if that's what you mean. Willie hopped up into the saddle. Aside from that, there's something kind of peculiar in the storeroom. The storeroom was where everything coming or going by train sat until it was picked up. A sliding door opened onto a small loading dock next to the tracks. A door led from the storeroom directly into the telegraph office. Something peculiar. What's that supposed to mean? See for yourself. All I know is it was there when I come in this morning. It must have been brought in on Harley's shift, but he never mentioned it. Just hightailed it out of here. Gee up. Willie nudged the mare and started off, calling back over his shoulder. Good luck, Gideon. Merry Christmas. Gideon scowled. Willie had been known to take a snort on the job, something the railroad frowned upon, but ignored so long as it didn't affect an employee's performance of his duties. But he hadn't smelled anything on Willie's breath. Then again, the man was easily spooked. A week ago, when Gideon had walked in on him in the middle of a transmission, Willie fairly jumped out of his chair. At the time, Gideon had thought nothing of it, but perhaps the day shift telegrapher was getting a little loopy. Willie read books during his shift, crime novels mostly. Maybe that explained it. An overactive imagination was not part of the job description. Gideon shut the barn door and walked across the yard to the station house. The snow was picking up. Looking into the swirl of flakes, he suddenly felt dizzy, as if the world had, without warning, reversed its spin. He rubbed his eyes and walked into the office, hooking his heavy, snow-dusted coat on the hook beside the door. Gideon fed a couple of logs into the pot-bellied stove, then put the kettle on. Strong, hot coffee, just the way his Swedish papa prepared it, boiling the grounds for a good ten minutes, with just a ticket for a night like this. It would fend off cold and sleep, a telegrapher's greatest enemies. Time to check on inventory and determine whatever it was that had so unsettled Willie. Gideon poured himself a cup of coffee and carried it into the storeroom. As he expected, it was mostly empty. Orders for farm supplies and equipment wouldn't be coming in until February or March of the next year. Now the room contained nothing but the outgoing mailbag and two boxes. One was bound with steel straps and padlock shut. The sort of box one might expect to find filled with gold bullion or at least a company payroll. Well, that was a mite strange. Gideon had never before seen anything like it arrive or depart from the station. Maybe it was wages for the hundreds of construction workers and engineers building dams up and down the Columbia River. The other box, however, was evidently what had driven Willie out into the cold. It was six feet long and two feet wide, and made of pine. Eight penny nails ran round the perimeter of the lid, spaced only an inch or so apart. It wasn't a box meant to be open, Gideon guessed. In block letters, stenciled on the lid and both sides were the words, Property of Washington State Museum, and in smaller red letters, Native American Artifact. Gideon had heard the rumors about Indian burial sites being disturbed by the new dams, 
but paid them no mind. Archaeologists and historians by all accounts were having a field day. The strong box, however, was listed as railroad property. And just then, the telegraph sprang to life, clattering out a message. Without leaving the storeroom, Gideon recognized the syncopated style of Gordon Smithson and Freda. Smithson spent his free evenings dancing to swing music in Wenatchee, and the beat had infected his morse. So much so that even his closest friends called him Krupp, after the drummer Gene Krupa. Ten o'clock freight delayed by blizzard, swung the message. Spokane ETA uncertain, digging out now just as Gideon figured. If the blizzard had already hit Ephrata, it was only an hour, maybe an hour and a half away. It could be hours or days before they cleared the tracks. Normally, Gideon wouldn't have minded the challenge. So long as the telegraph wires didn't come down in the blizzard, it would have been a snap. But now there was what was obviously a coffin to consider, and Gideon could guess as to its contents. The university anthropologists loved their native bones. It wasn't so much that he was bothered by death. Before apprenticing himself to a telegrapher, he'd considered becoming a mortician, altering his career plans only when he found out the smell of formaldehyde gave him migraines. No, death itself was not the problem. It was simply that after a couple days in a cozy station house, a corpse might become a bit ripe. And Gideon, with his keen sense of smell, thought he could already detect the warmed-up, musty whiff of skeletal remains. Better move him out into the loading dock, he thought, and keep the ferment to a minimum. He set his coffee down on the strong box and wrestled open the sliding door leading out onto the loading dock and wedged it open. Then he leaned down, set his shoulder against the edge of the coffin-shaped box, and gave it a shove. Heavier than it looked, it didn't budge. Gideon strained his weight against it, the tendons tautening like ropes on his neck, his temples throbbing, but he couldn't move it an inch. Nearly ready to give up, Gideon gave it one last mighty push. Without warning, the coffin scooched forward, skidding across the plank floor, out through the open doors, and onto the loading dock, where it teetered precariously over the railroad tracks. Gideon lay on his belly on the floor, staring at it in astonishment. The damn thing must have been frozen in place. That was the only explanation for it. The floor beneath the storage area wasn't insulated, so a cold wind could have blasted through the crawl space and frozen the box to the floor. The funny thing was, where he was lying now, the floor was warm. Gideon snorted and extended his arms to push himself up. A sudden hot spike of pain lanced through his right shoulder. He must have torn or pulled a muscle when the box let go. Climbing to his feet using only his left arm, the telegrapher gently probed his injury. The muscle running diagonally from his shoulder down to the middle of his back twanged along its entire length whenever he tried to move his arm. Lucky for him, he was ambidextrous and only a bit slower on the key with his left hand. Gingerly, he tucked his right hand into the front of his shirt and, using only his left arm, inched the box back from the edge of the dock. This time, the coffin-shaped box slid easily back into the warm storeroom. Well, then, he muttered aloud, stay here and rot if you want. Hell do I care. What was the matter with him? Now he was talking to coffins. He limped into the office and slammed the door behind him. What remained of the pot of coffee on stove had boiled halfway down to the dregs. Gideon poured himself a cup of black tar and chased down a couple of aspirins. He settled back in his chair, waiting for the throbbing in his shoulder to subside. Now, Gideon was not a nervous man and, in fact, scoffed at others for exhibiting the jitters. But pain may have eroded some of that placid Scandahoovian topsoil. Two things happened almost simultaneously. A muffled thump from the storeroom. And the telegraph sprang to life. Gideon was startled. It was hardly what you might call a twitch, 
but to him it was a veritable earthquake. Not that he ever dropped a stitch. In an instant, he had a pencil in his left hand, noting down the telegraph. Odd thing was, there was no call sign given, and thus the identity and location of the telegrapher was unknown. The message was rapid and unadorned, transmitted without quirk or accent of any kind. Dot, dash, dash, dot, dash, 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 dot, dash, dot, 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 dot. Watch the box. Gideon noted it on his pad. A few seconds passed. Then the message was repeated in a burst, dot for dot and dash for dash. Watch the box. Its regularity and precision could only compare with his own. Telegraphy without kinks, without a personal touch, and he'd never been on the receiving end of it before. ID, please, Gideon keyed with his left hand. There was no response. All he could figure was that Jake or Sparky or Curly was playing a prank on him. Even Gordon might be in on it. Problem was, none of them had the chops to pull it off, which meant it had to be someone new, someone with the brain of a calculator and a finger of coiled steel. Gideon began to tap a second ID request when another thump, somewhat louder than the first, came from the storeroom. What could it be? Rats? Raccoons? He had to take a gander. In the doorway, Gideon held up his lantern. Nothing in the storeroom but the strong box and the coffin. Neither had been moved. The loading bay door was shut tight. Behind him, the telegraph began to chatter again. Watch the box. He shook his head. This was becoming annoying. Gideon was a man who prepared for every eventuality. Every moment in his life was presupposed and then rehearsed. He had little use for imagination except in this one area. He calculated every possible scenario that might arise in his daily life and determined his exact response. Driving to the station house that evening, he had worked out how to respond to a cougar attack. Unlikely as it might be that a cougar would attack a moving shea and horse, it was within the realm of possibility. He'd also considered what to do if a wheel came off on the road, traversing the high gully near his house. He planned when to jump, when to pull his gun or knife on a foe, how best to survive a fire in a flood zone, what to do when falling through thin ice, and what words would discourage the young farmer's widow who brought him fruit soup and apple pies. He had, however, never prepared himself for anything remotely like this. Watch the box. He swore aloud and shocked himself. He was not a man who used profanities, not out of any moral or religious squeamishness, but because it suggested a lack of control. Watch the... Gideon interrupted the incoming message and began to key with ferocious speed. Identify yourself, he demanded. You are misusing railway property. Identify now. The telegraph fell silent. Gideon waited. Outside, the wind suddenly picked up, rattling a loose pane in the station house window. The blizzard had arrived. Gideon opened the window, reached around, and pulled in the shutters. In the storeroom, something thudded and began to move about. This time, something much heavier than a raccoon. Either a thief was making a clumsy attempt on the strong box, or a bear after carry-on had somehow found its way into the station house. Thieves and bears Gideon had planned for. He hoisted the Remington from its brace on the wall, cradled it in one hand, and advanced into the storeroom. No bears or thieves. The strong box had not moved. The coffin had it had swung about on its axis a good 90 degrees from where Gideon had left it. What's more, in the flickering light of the lantern, he could see a dark, even crack had opened up between its lid and side. 
The exposed shanks of eight penny nails gleamed like fangs, and Gideon's mind began to race. It picked up and examined possible explanations and tossed them away like a nervous beachcomber searching for agates. Nothing in his life had prepared him for anything but rational explanations, and that was what he hit upon now. There were two possibilities. It could be nothing more than a gag, elaborate and exceedingly well-planned, but a gag nonetheless. Or else it was an elaborate scheme cooked up to steal the strongbox. Willie's ominous intimations. Something kind of peculiar, he'd said, in his eagerness to leave. The message from Croup about a late train. Then the mysterious watch the box. And finally, the coffin itself. All of it calculated to try and give him a fright. So who was hiding in the box? Maybe Willie had doubled back and climbed in through a secret door like a vaudeville magician. Did he believe Gideon would run away like a frightened rabbit, leaving him with either a great yarn or the payroll in the strong box? Whoever's there, joke's over and done, Gideon announced. I ain't scared and I'm armed, so you may as well come on out. He waited for a response. For a few seconds, the storm seemed to pause, as if nature itself was holding its breath. Gideon diddled the trigger on the rifle. Then it all came back with a rush. The wind howled and the telegraph clattered, but the box, the box most of all, it must have leapt three inches off the floor, as if an immense shoulder had rammed it against the lid from inside. The gap between it and the sides grew wider by half an inch. Watch! Another powerful thrust, and the gap widened further. Nothing human could have made that impact. Gideon backed away, dropping the rifle. The complex areas of Gideon's prefrontal lobes seated control the more primitive areas at the back of the brain, and he lunged for the 28-ounce claw hammer under the workbench. Box! He stumbled back into the storeroom and hammered the coffin lid back down, driving the upright nails home with his good left arm. For a moment, the gap was closed and the coffin sat still. Gideon slumped against it, sweating, gasping for breath. At his back, on the other side of inch-thick pine board, he could feel a malevolent power biding its time, like a cougar poised and waiting to spring on its unsuspecting prey, a cougar that knew it didn't have long to wait. That was when he heard the scratching at the door. Gideon struggled to his feet and edged back into the office. This wasn't fluffy on a cold night, scratching to be let in. Something large was just outside the door, clawing and gnawing at the thick hemlock planks, and now working at the latch. Gideon launched himself at the door and somehow shut the bolt just before it flew open. The creature outside made a sound Gideon had never heard before, at once furious and disconsolate and then redoubled its assault on the door. The wood bent around the bolt, and the jam creaked under the strain. He gathered up a handful of nails from the toolbox and began hammering the door into its frame. Two nails, three, then four. The telegraph crackled to life once more. Watch the box, it demanded. In the storeroom, the coffin began its thumping dance, and through the open doorway, Gideon could see the crack begin to widen once more. Watch the box! Hammering a fifth nail into the doorframe, it suddenly came to him. With the hopeless clarity of the damned, Gideon understood his predicament. There were too many boxes, boxes within boxes, and he was caught in the middle. Whatever was outside wanted in, whatever was inside wanted out. With a high-pitched giggle, Gideon lurched back to the shuttering coffin, hammering it shut with a dozen desperate strokes, then back to the door where the thick framing nails were bending at unheard of pressures. Back and forth he ran, drove in new spikes, secured the rising lid, hammered at the bulging door. Watch the box, nattered the telegraph. Outside the wind moaned around the beleaguered station, whistling down the telegraph wires. Or was it something else? A train? A tiny spark of hope flared in Gideon's pounding chest. Had they dug the train out in Spokane? No, 
Not possible. They'd never sent a train out in a raging blizzard unless the blizzard had abated quickly. Then they might just send out a train to clear the tracks before a freeze. He heard the whistle again of the wind, but not the wind, a slight shift in frequency twanging above the howling gusts. There wasn't much time left. The wood around both door and jam was battered and splintered and would give at any moment. The lid on the coffin, too, threatened to fly off with each massive thrust from within. Gideon knew it was now or never. Either something was coming in or something was busting out. But if Gideon Craswell was still in the station when it did, he knew his life would be measured out in seconds. The plan he came up with wasn't much of a plan, but he had to do something. Even if the door held and the lid stayed on, the muscles in his left arm could barely lift the hammer. His right arm, barely capable of setting the nails, had now gone completely numb in its improvised sling. Gideon drove the loosening nails home one last time through the shuttering door jam. Foul, hot breath poured through the gaping cracks in the door. He ran to the coffin and hammered the lid closed once more. The telegraph joined in the din. Gideon ran to the loading dock, threw the latch, slid the door open on its track, and peeked out. Nothing there. Whatever it was was spending its fury on the office door. With his heart jumping in his throat, he slipped through the sliding door and stepped off the loading dock down onto the rails. No sign of the train through the swirl of white, but he was sure, absolutely sure, he could hear it coming down the tracks. He ran east in the direction of the Spokane train. He knew it wouldn't be long before the creatures inside and out knew he had gone. A few minutes at most, and would track him down, and he wouldn't be hard to find. An inch or two of fresh snow on the flat ground broken only by his trail of footprints. Almost as an afterthought, he noticed his hand was bleeding from a deep gash. He didn't remember cutting himself, but with every step he sent droplets of blood flying into the snow another trail for the beast to follow. Gideon ran on, glancing over his shoulder, expecting at any moment to be attacked from behind, hoping, praying, though he had never prayed before in his life, that the train would reach him first. After half a mile, the ice-cold air was searing his lungs. His legs felt like they were about to drop off, but he stumbled on like a rag doll on a string. Keep going, he told himself, keep going. But then he stepped into a hole between the rails, turned his ankle, and crashed down onto the tracks. For a second, he just lay there, breathing hard and ragged, staring up into the chaos of snow. Is this where I die? Gideon thought to himself. Does it all end here? Then he heard it. A steam whistle, loud and close, maybe only 200 yards off and coming up fast lit up the night sky like a sunrise. Gideon pushed to his feet, hopped to the side of the tracks, and began to wave. The blizzard gaped open in front of the big steam engine like butter before a hot knife. Gideon waved his arms and almost laughed with relief. The train didn't stop. Its engineer never saw him standing there in his white shirt and gray pants like a ghost in the snow. How could he have? Gideon's cries were lost in the rumble of the five or six passing cars. He watched the red lamp of the caboose wink and dissolve into the white. In a moment, the train would arrive, and the engineer and the brakeman would hop down and go looking for the absent telegrapher, and they would find whatever was waiting inside the box. Gideon heard the whistle blow as they pulled into the station. The old man poured me another cup of coffee. Next morning, they found Gideon Craswell half frozen, near out of his mind, half mile from the station house. It was weeks before he could tell anybody what had happened, and nobody really much believed him. They found a hammer and nails in the banged up door, but not much else by way of evidence. No coffin, no dead body, nothing. If it had been there, it was gone. Strong box with company payroll in it, though, hadn't even been touched. Strange thing was, no one could ever explain it satisfactorily. The train that had pulled out of Spokane just after they'd cleared the tracks seemed to disappeared into thin air. They searched high and low for weeks, even checking sightings that had been abandoned for years. 
Never found the train, the engineer, or brakeman, though. Harry looked at me and grinned. All happened right about this time of year, too. I shook my head in disbelief. He didn't really think I would swallow an old ghost story like that, did he? I may have been young, but I wasn't that gullible. Harry sighed and ran his fingers through thinning gray hair. You're the one nearly got run down by a train that don't exist, kid. Believe it or not, don't matter to me. But to the end of his life, when you'd ask Gideon about it, all he'd say was, watch the box. Watch the box. From far away, as if in response to Harry's words, I heard a distant train. Not the honking, multi-toned horns you hear today, but the lonely whistle of a lost steam engine. <laughs> 